Hello, I am Professor S. Shankaran in the Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering. Hello everyone, welcome to this lecture on mechanical testing now. Uh, we have been uh, seeing you know, all the physical metallurgical aspects uh, of materials in the context of mechanical behavior in the previous classes. And from this uh, uh, point onwards, we will discuss about uh, mechanical testing, which is a uh, very important uh, aspect in this uh, field of mechanical engineering as well as metallurgical and materials engineering. And as we uh, talked in the introduction section, I will not get into the specific uh, method of testing all these uh, mechanical tests, which uh, we can always find it from the uh, standard ASTM standards or any other st uh, standards which is universally accepted. Uh, rather, we would like to uh, look at the you know interpretation of the test outcome. For example, we are talking about the spectrum of materials which are going to respond to the mechanical force. Okay, this is all about this course, right? So uh, we would look at, uh, uh, for example, particular state of uh, you know testing. For example, tensile when the, when the material is subjected to tensile testing, then how it responds. So we will look at this kind of aspect. So similarly, we will go through a gamut of uh, testing, right? Like uh, tensile impact uh, fracture and uh, uh, most popular one among these tests is a simple tensile test and then from this tensile test people try to derive as much information as possible right and then we'll spend a lot more time on this uh, tensile testing and then a lot of information a uh, wealth of information is available in the variety of you know uh, for materials and then people take uh, take away quite a bit of information about this simple tensile test so uh, we will spend more time on that but uh, even before tensile test there is much more simpler test uh, uh, is possible in terms of mechanical uh, behavior if you want to assess uh, a straightforward very quick assessment of uh, uh, mechanical behavior is uh, a hardness test so we will start with the very simple uh, test called hardness test and even in the hardness test there are variety of hardness tests are possible because uh, uh, with respect to uh, various kinds of materials. So those days uh, uh, there are particular type of hardness tests were specifically meant for metals and uh, other hard materials. But then when you talk about today different kind of materials to ceramics, composites, polymers, right? So uh, viscoelastic material, non-crystalline material and so on and so forth. So the hardness test also has uh, a spectrum of methods you know, we can just uh, come across. So let us start with something called a scratch hardness, the very basic uh, hardness uh, testing method. And um, before even getting to the scratch hardness, let us see what is hardness. Hardness is not a fundamental property. It's not like a, your Young's model is or shear model is or Poisson's ratio and so on. However, it is very important in the context of engineering applications. Okay, so we'll see how it is. So hardness is not a fundamental property of a material, and depending upon the context of measurement, it may mean resistant resistance to scratching, abrasion, cutting, and penetration. So these are all the uh, attributes here. Uh, how whether it is resistant to scratch, resistance to abrasion, or resistance to cutting, or resistance to penetration. Okay. For example, scratch hardness uh, may not be of any significance to structural engineer, but it is of paramount importance to mineralogist and geologist. This is quite obvious, right? A structural engineer will not get enough information about the material through scratch hardness right because for a structural engineer the strength and toughness they are of the primary uh, important properties okay on the other hand uh, people like mineralogists and uh, geologists will find it very interesting data from out of this kind of a scratch hardness so this is a very fundamental hardness so let us see what it is in the most scale of scratch hardness, so the most the scratch hardness is measured in most scale. 
okay hardness is rated by a group of 10 common minerals arranged in an arbitrary scale of progressively increasing hardness from 1 to 10 the minerals are arranged in the following order what are those minerals these are all the minerals from a talc gypsum calcite chloride apatite felsbar quartz topaz corundum and diamond okay so here the order is 1 to 10 represents the most hardness numbers in using the most scale the hardness number is found scratching the minerals progressively by the test material the material in which we are interested to find the hardness we are going to scratch with the testing material until the hardest material that the test material will scratch which is formed so what what does it mean i want to find a uh, hardness of uh, something something like that some material x so i take this x material and make a scratch on all this minerals from 1 to 10 okay so there will be a material on which my material the x will make a scratch on them is found out okay the hardness of the test material then lies between the two standards that it will just scratch and one that it fails to scratch so obviously some of the material will try to scratch some material it will not scratch so it will it will be in between these two numbers so that is the measure of hardness for example Tungsten carbide lies between 9 and 10, fingernail is between 2 and 3, lead is at 1, copper is between 3 and 4, glass is between 5 and 6, and hardened steel is between 6 and 7. So it's quite interesting just by comparison of a you know, scratch mark on the various minerals, you try to assess the hardness of the material. This is one way of assessing the uh, strength in a very crude way, right? But then it's very useful. Uh, for some people the next type of hardness is rebound hardness what is this rebound hardness the shore cellar scope a portable instrument determines the rebound hardness by measuring the rebound height of a standard weight typically a hammer dropped from a fixed height onto a surface so it is called also called the shore hardness though the equipment name is shore cellar scope okay it utilizes a small diamond tipped hammer weighing 1 by 16 pound with a rounded tip which is allowed to free fall inside a glass tube from a height of 10 inch onto a test surface. So basically you have this tip which is enclosed in a tube and then you try to drop it on the surface of interest. So the height of rebound is measured against the graduated scale inside the tube. The scale is arbitrary and graduated to 140 divisions and it is based on the rebound height of 100 divisions from the hardened high carbon steel. So it's a kind of a relative uh, rebound height that decides the or that gives kind of idea about the hardness of the material and indirectly the strength. Okay. Accurate vertical alignment of the tube is necessary for accurate results the hardness of large structural parts can be conveniently measured using this instrument the scleroscope measures the dynamic hardness and the method is also known as elastic rebound method because the the rebound takes place because of elasticity right so it is called elastic rebound method the dynamic hardness is a measure of elastic energy stored in the body due to impact by the intender so it's a measure of elastic energy as well stored energy as well okay for example if you take a big polymeric uh, sheet very big polymer sheet typically used a variety of applications okay people even use those uh, thick uh, polymeric sheets in uh, foundations okay which as a shock absorber big big foundations there the hardness of this material is crucial it has got a specific shore hardness commercially it is uh, told shore hardness right? 
So this is all uh, very important. So all the polymeric uh, material, semi-crystalline material, rubbery material, they use these kind of hardness. Therefore, materials like rubber with a low elastic modulus usually give rebound hardness numbers higher than that of a steel. That is quite obvious, right? So any low elastic modulus materials, how to assess the hardness is by the rebound, uh, elastic rebound method. Okay, let us now uh, come to the, uh, the other primary method of uh, hardness testing. Look at this table, it's a huge table, it is a quite popular table which is given in most of the fundamental uh, first, uh, first year level of textbooks it is given because it's a very fundamental property. And then you have uh, uh, Brennell hardness, Wicker hardness, Loop hardness and Rockwell hardness. Okay. Rockwell hardness of course uh, it's measured at a different different scale depending upon the intender geometry and the load. Okay. So you see that uh, what is common uh, in all the hardness testing method. Each hardness test is going to use a particular type of intender. In this case it is about 10 mm sphere of steel or a tension carbide ball. And it is going to look like uh, from the side view like this. So the capital D is a diameter of the wall of the sphere. And small d is the, the distance or the diameter of the impression it is going to make on the surface. Okay, so this is the top view of the impression after indentation mark. And this is the impression made because of the load which is gained given by this and then the formula for hardness number. So what is this formula? BH and Brunel hardness number. Okay. okay, so like that Wicker's hardness, it is using a, a diamond pyramid indenter which has got the geometry like this from the side view. The angle between these two uh, angular faces about one, 136 degree and then it makes an impression of a, a square of course it is uh, uh, you can see that this is in the taper so it will make a uh, taper inside it will make an impression inside okay and then the diagonals are measured d1 and d2 if it is very different but if it is ideally it is expected to be same and this is the formula for calculating this and uh, loop hardness which uses a diamond pyramid uh, uh, in under again, so it makes an impression like this. And then Rockwell, which is uh, which is measured at different scale, also uses a different type of indenter. Diamond cone indenter is uh, like this, and it makes a impression like a circular impression. And also, it is a one by sixteen inch diameter steel sphere or one by eight inch diameter steel sphere. Also, will make a, a ball will also will make an impression like this on the material. And then depending upon the load with which you are making an indentation, the, the hardness is measured in the respective different different scales. Okay. Okay. So what, what is that we need to know? This is a very simple uh, test uh, or primary test every industry or anybody who is interested in knowing the mechanical behavior of material or any material, they directly, indirectly assess the strength. They don't have the direct access, <coughs> excuse me, direct as, access to measure the uh, strength. So this is one way of connecting the uh, strength through this hardness measurement. So, so we need to under, understand what is the physics behind it and then how to uh, interpret the results. This is what we need to, need to know. So it makes uh, this kind of uh, impression what I have shown here is is a Brinnell is a one which makes a very huge impression a spherical impression the Rockwell C is much smaller spherical impression and then there is a superficial Rockwell which is again which is small and then Vickers is a very very small uh, a pyramid impression it will going to make okay so the hardness test measures the resistance of a material to an intenter or cutting tool the intenter is usually a ball, pyramid, or a cone made up made up of 
uh, much harder than the being tested. For example, hardened steel, sintered tension carbide, diamond. These are all listed here. So you can see this. An empirical hardness number may be calculated from the results of such test by knowledge of load applied and cross sectional area or depth of impression. So, so these are all an empirical relation based on the knowledge of load applied that is P is a load divided by the cross sectional area of the impression. So these are all empirical relation which gives some idea about the material hardness. Okay. What is the mechanics? Let us understand the mechanics. So this is the, uh, so let us consider this uh, a spherical impression uh, out of this Brindle hardness tester. So as I just mentioned, this is uh, capital D of the diameter of the wall indenter and this small d is the, the diameter of the impression it makes on the surface here. So how do we connect this uh, small d with the capital D? So it makes, uh, suppose you just uh, extend this surface line here and then and, and write a, I mean right after that you just mark a perpendicular to this, then it makes a angle, just find out the angle with which it is uh, just uh, expanding on this. So the angle is angle between the, the perpendicular and this uh, horizontal line is phi. So the diameter of the impression D can be uh, D sine phi is equal to capital D. Okay. So depending upon the uh, the depth of the impression, depth of this indentation which goes into this, and this can be uh, a sine phi of D can be related to uh, the capital G. Okay, so that is how we can find out. And normally what happens is uh, uh, indenter makes an impression which is plastic, a plastic impression and then the surrounding material is plastic. And then because of this, uh, it leaves a plastic zone uh, surrounding by the elastic uh, region there is some uh, something which you know we need to understand especially in the uh, state of stress so now that we know uh, mechanics a little bit so we, we need to understand the state of stress behind the indenter so what is that so it is found that by applying yield criteria the condition for plasticity is first reached at a point below the center of the circle of the contact at a distance equal to approximately one fourth the diameter of the circle of contact. Okay. When the indenter is pressed, shear takes place on countless number of slip planes of maximum shear, shear stress near the indenter. So this is an indenter. As it just penetrates the material, it generates countless number of slip planes. Okay. Uh, especially the, the maximum shear stress near the indenter, especially the just below the indenter, it is going to create a lot of slip plates. That means, so we are talking about this region just below this. So you have uh, from surface to this maximum uh, depth, there is a huge distance. So that means all these depths, then the slip is not going to be uniform. So you should expect some non-uniform plastic deformation. So what is that? That's what we are going to see. An amount of material gets displaced due to the decrease in the volume of elastic material. The elastic region surrounding the plastic zone then puts a constraint on the plastic zone from the further deformation. You see this, uh, this part, particular elastic uh, region surrounding this plastic zone is going to constrain this plastic deformation to further deform. So that is something we have to understand. So what is so what happens as a result? The mean pressure PM 
which is nothing but p divided by 4p divided by 5d square. This is a load divided by the circular area accepted by the indenter far exceeds the flow stress sigma of the material. So it crosses this mean pressure crosses the yield strength of the material. Okay, so this can be written it like this Pm is equal to 4p by pi d square is equal to c times sigma naught, where c is the constraint factor. Based on the elastoplastic analysis, the constraint factor c is found to vary between 2.6 if maximum shear stress theory is used and it is 3 if one mass criterion is used. So you know now all this uh, basic yield criterion and the material flow and all that. So you should be able to relate all those things here even um, in the inundation mechanics. So these values apply to materials that do not work hard. And please, it is a very important point. If the, the material is susceptible to what hardening, then these measurements, I mean these assumptions will not hold good. For work hardening material, sigma naught in the equation must be considered as the average flow stress for and average flow strain in the plastic zone. So it is not uh, independent, but it is an average as a whole. So now let us uh, understand a little more about this mechanics. So the material is undergone some plastic deformation under the indenter. But what is shown here, there are two possibilities. Limits of plastic and elastic deformation around the indentation. A ridge type common in hard or work hardened material. If the material is work hard hardening, I mean the material undergoes work hardening, during this uh, hardness testing, then it can create a ridge like this. Okay. On the other hand, a sinking type a common in soft or annealed materials. If it is too soft, a material is being tested for hardness using this spherical indenter, it can also produce a sinking edge surrounding the indentation. So one of the principal errors that occurs when measuring the hardness is in measuring the diameter of the indentation which gets altered due to elastic recovery of the material. Okay. The ridge, ridging type of indentation is observed in hard or cold work materials where no more strain hardening is possible. As the indenter is pressed, the material simply tends to pile up around the indenter. This results an overestimate of the indentation diameter leading to lower hardness determination. In the soft or well annealed material, a sinking type of indentation results owing to a high rate of strain hardening accompanied by a elastic relaxation around the indentation or indenter. In this case, the measured indentation diameter will be smaller than the actual measurement, resulting in an erroneously high hardness estimate. So, what it emphasizes here is, irrespective of any hardness uh, uh, testing method, what this illustration um, demonstrates is the impression which creates the indentation impression has to be made perfectly. Otherwise, it will have positive and negative influence. So the geometry of the impression is so crucial in taking the results of the any hard any type of hardness. That's the main idea. In the process of indentation, the material immediately below the indenter is plastically deformed and the elastic material surrounding the plastic zone hinders the further deformation. So this again we have shown in the schematic. As a result, a strain gradient manifests itself within the volume below the indenter, the strain being greatest near the indenter surface and the least at the elastoplastic interface. Very, very important. So the strain will be very high at the bottom and it will be small in the elastoplastic interface like this here. So indentation geometry clearly and indentation mechanics clearly shows that there is a 
strain gradient exists in the every impression. So, this is the primary uh, information you have to keep in mind. So, what are the other uh, hardness test, uh, testing, uh, sophisticated hardness testing? So, this is uh, nano indentation. This, this particular uh, tool again is uh, quite uh, popular uh, because it uses very, very small loads and then you can find out the hardness for the even a small segment, very sub-micron features, you can go and test the hardness in the microstructure. So, that is what it is. Let us see what it is. The penetration of the indenter into a specimen is measured by very sensitive capacitance gauge or very sensitive capacitance gauge. The resolution of the applied load may be less than 50 nanonewton. Please note that number. 50 nanonewton. While displacement resolution can be as small as less than 0 0.02 nanometer. So, you see that uh, you, you will be able to measure the hardness such a small dimension at uh, in the microstructure. So, this is the advantage of this. So, what is this? This is a load displacement uh, uh, plot. So, we will see one by one how to understand this curve. A, a nano indenter records the total penetration of an indenter into the sample. The indenter may be moved toward the sample or away from the sample by means of magnetic coil assembly. So, one can measure the hardness or elastic modulus of a phase in a material. As the indenter penetrates the specimen, the indentation load and displacement are recorded continuously during a load and load cycle. So, what is plotted in this uh, diagram is a loading and unloading cycle. So, you see that uh, the load loading increases, it reaches the maximum that is a P max and then unloading takes place. Okay, So, that means the, the net uh, penetration is H, depth is H. What is the maximum penetration depth is H max. Okay. So, you can uh, you can also just you know uh, take uh, some other parameters from this curve. The S stands for the stiffness. The stiffness can be measured by you know change in uh, load. Uh, this basically a slope. That means what? dp by dh will give you the, the stiffness of the uh, phase which you are interested. So, what is important in this uh, hardness tester? This hardness tester uses very, very small load and it can sense very small, small displacements in uh, sub uh, micron scale. So, you will be able to uh, understand the, the strength of very, very tiny, you know, sub micron features or sub micron entities in the microstructure. You can measure the mechanical strength. So, that is the idea. The maximum load and the corresponding displacement are calculated from the plastic depth of indentation. The hardness H is given by H is equal to P max by A. It is a load by area. Where P max is the load and A is the projected area of the contact at, at peak load. The contact area at the peak load is determined by the geometry of indenter and the depth of contact HC. So, again here, here also the, the impression of the indenter okay, is quite crucial. Okay. See, as such, it is very sensitive to the load and the displacement. So, it is far more crucial to measure the exact impression. Let us see what are the uh, available methods. Assuming that the indenter does not deform significantly, we can write A is equal to F of HC. That is, the form of function f must be established experimentally. The area a can be calculated by means of the following expression. a is equal to a plus b h i to the power half plus c h i plus d h i to the power d by 2 plus 24.56 h i square. So, this is kind of an, an empirical relation where h i is the plastic depth of the indentation and a, b, c, d are the adjustable coefficients. Why we need this adjustable coefficients? For a perfect tip, A equal to B equal to C equal to D is equal to 0. 
and the only coefficient is 24.56. So that means if you are making a perfect impression with this indentation, then all these coefficients will become zero. So these are all adjustable coefficients for the and different, different non-perfect impression. So that is how we got to understand. The stiffness S can be obtained from the load P versus penetration uh, depth H by the following expression relating the reduced modulus ER. Why it is called reduced modulus? The contact area and the stiffness S can be given like this. S is equal to dP by dH. We have seen in the previous plot this uh, slope which is uh, 2 by square root of pi times ER times square root of A. The reduced modulus ER of the indenter sample combination takes into account the fact that elastic deformation under load occurs in the sample as well as in the indenter. So that's why it is reduced modulus. So the reduced modulus is given by ER is equal to 1 minus U i square divided by e i plus 1 minus u s square divided by e f where e i and e s are the Young's modeling and v i and v s are Poisson's ratio not v mu mu i and u s are the Poisson's ratio of the inventor and sample respectively. The initial unloading slope gives us the reduced modulus provided one can measure the contact area of the peak globe. 